minimizing charisma, maximizing intelligence, shooting someone in the crotch with a cannonball, thrust, propulsion, it's sciency. <laughs> Why you always gotta be blowing my spot up like that? There are my runes. There they are. I'm not mad. Science needs art and art needs science. They both need each other to function properly. There are ways to figure out what the paper is really saying. And then I'm ready to get on Twitter and yell at people about doing their own research on the- oh! oh, hold on there, sports fan. Kyle Hill, everybody, is the next generation of science communicator. I'm going to be too old at a certain point to do those terrible things to my body, and it'll be up to you. He's got like a lion's <laughs> guy's amazing. <laughs> Kyle Hill. I'm Boo Rambo. The universe is indifferent to you. Whether or not you have amazing hair, the universe doesn't care. How are trees pushing past this pressure limit? Ah! Behold, my balls. Ah! <laughs> now we're getting somewhere, but I still don't think it's worthy of G.R.R. Martin suspender. I'm totally right, right? Oops up photos of my my frickin' hair? Is that what you all want? No, you don't, weirdos. Kyle Hill. Is your last name actually Hemsworth? What's going on? Our, our resident Thor no. lookalike. I prefer uh, Black Friday Chris Hemsworth. Oh, thank you. Hey, you know, if you need a haircut. No, of course not. We're not going to send sharks with frickin' laser beams on their heads to an asteroid. We're going to nuke it. You don't need Bruce Willis at all. <laughs> Wrenched. Oh! oh! Headshot! Oh! Kevin, turn on the monitor. Kevin, this transition better work. The blast door is camped. Kevin, turn it on. Ke Kevin. And Kevin, call his agent and have them call my agent. Kyle Hill. Happy birthday. Feliz Navidad. I'm just a biologist. I don't know how this works. This is how you do science. Can I just grab it? Oh. Laws. Corollaries. <laughs> <laughs> I know that global catastrophe isn't the most fun thing to think about all day unless you're me, so... Are we going to do some science, bro? <laughs> Lasers don't have that much momentum. That's not how a clockwise works. <laughs> don't worry, you can do this even if you are not an AI. It points the boundary layer around a person to identify. And I guess it matters what kind of dragon we're talking to realize here is that the bigger the thing does- This kite is completely inaccurate. I'm gonna kill this guy and tell him to his face. You're wrong about physics. Not enough lift force. Oh. Nuclear metal donut thing with magnetically confined star-like plasma. The radiation flux in here alone is enough to cause instant death. That's really funny. I like that idea. Hey, look at me. I'm a streamer. I have a bedroom. We know anything with a decapitation hazard deserves to, uh, yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, oh that's good. That's fine. Put it on PBS. I dare you. No, no, no. Well, of course they don't know we have this yet. No, no, no. If they knew we had a reactor core, anything like this, they would come for us at what? Uh, yeah, no, no. Uh, uh, uh large chain whips on rotate. It's kind of like a Ferris wheel of death. That's how I like to pitch it to customers. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, yeah. Laser bees. Um, automated water cannon. They're like the water cutters, but on can. I know. I know. I don't know why they don't do it. They're already on the ocean. What's that? No, 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 totally secure. This line, I already checked this line, so there's no way that any. Oh, um. Craig Weapons? I'll call you back later. Okay. I know, I can't believe it's your name either. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, I should probably get started. Okay. Love you, bye. You did not hear a single word of that. Hello? And welcome to Office Hours, a live component of the facility where good old Professor Kyle opens up some sort of sciency aperture and allows all of you, members of the public, mem members of my security team, j -Bo and Heather, members of all types, in to the facility proper for the next hour or so as we discuss all that's going on in the weeks of sciences. This week we'll be talking about a new breakthrough in fusion technology that actually has some twists and turns that I myself didn't expect. We are going to go through what fusion is, through the breakthrough, and into the very data of these papers themselves because I believe 
that with the power of science, you and I can learn something from it. Of course, if you want to continue on this conversation after we are live, you can go back to the main facility channel. You can go back to the gaming channel. You can try Super Chats here, right here in the video. I cannot promise I will get to everything live, but I'll do my very best. Just know that if I don't get to it, it all goes towards good cause, mainly fixing this light. Oh, ho, ho, ho. timing. Of course, you can always join the facility for our patrons only discord bloopy bloops all that kind of good stuff i'm happy to have everyone here uh predator acer says can you explain why i should be asleep right now yes you don't get enough uh kellen welcome sergey welcome hello everyone hello kyle you science whiz if you were quoting someone what if you were quoting someone and their messages in all caps well <laughs> we still ban you here uh New fusion? Fill me up with knowledge, Science Thor. Okay, calm down. First. All right. So, uh, yes, we will be talking about the new fusion breakthrough that happened at the National Ignition Facility, where, spoiler alert, I actually filmed before. So I have um, insider knowledge into this project. I was curious how fusion worked last I checked. Uh... It's all steam turbines and everything. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. At the end of the day, all of our technologies are to turn turbines. Uh, most of them, uh, rather. But um, coal heats up water to turn turbines. Uh, nuclear power, fission, nuclear power heats up water to turn turbines. F uh, fusion will do the exact same thing, except for uh, this one, as Kargaroth, Karagoth is pointing out, involves laser beams. Steam is everything. So is it actually 40 years away now? I'm not so sure because this is interesting. Um, mostly a Steam game, right? Yes, you can buy a lot of nuclear reactors on Steam. Just don't tell them I sent you. Um, so why don't I don't I don't see anybody helping me out with this light. So why don't we just get right The fusion breakthrough that you may have heard about in the get out of here may have heard about in the news happened at this very location. This is the National Ignition Facility in Midern, that's Middle Urn, not Northern or Southern, Midern, California. Um, it is the largest laser facility in the world. And everything that happens happens inside all, all the exciting, sexy stuff happens inside of this chamber, as it often does. Now, it's the largest laser facility in the world because it is the size of three football fields long. Three football fields long. Did I not... <laughs> I may have done something different today, which is why... Oh, no, it's all... Okay. All right, never mind. Thought I messed something up today, but I didn't. See, this is all, uh, this all happens in real time. So, three football fields long, bouncing high-powered lasers, hundreds of them, dozens of them. It's like 192 beams, so it's not hundreds technically, but dozens of them, bouncing back and forth, getting amplified, getting powered up, and they all head towards that, that target bay, that spherical object that you see here, and this giant spherical object that you'll see here. So, just to give you an idea of the scale of this so-called big science project, this is what we're this is what we're actually talking about here. We're talking about a target bay that is absolutely enormous. But what it's firing at inside of that bay is very very small. It's just this tiny tiny little thing here. Now, before we go any further, we have to talk about what, I know, it's pretty metal. We have to talk about what we are trying to do with this in the first place, okay? So, fusion is, refers to nuclear fusion. And nuclear fusion is a grand promise for the future of energy because of how uh, much energy is released per kilogram 
of fuel that you use. We call this energy density. Shane Shockey with the 10, you amazing com. Just happy to be here to learn. The facility Discord is where all the fun happens. That's true. That's true. Um, my camera's being wonky today. You see that? See how the focus totally changed now? That's fun. So let's try to fix this in real time. So, uh, <laughs> so stupid. Um, turns out I can't do it in real time. Oh, that's why. That's why. You dumb thing. There we go. Kevin, if you turn my camera on autofocus one more time, <laughs> that will be the one more time of days that you have to live. Now, um, nuclear fusion is the promise because it has an incredibly high energy density, as we just mentioned. So how much energy, how many joules of energy to do work can you get out of some kilograms of fuel? Hey, show, love the Kyle, longtime commenter, first time viewer, says Dan Spinetta with the five. That doesn't make sense, Dan. So in terms of energy density, something like fossil fuels is incredibly energy dense, more dense than something like wood. So to run your car, you can get a lot of energy out of a single gallon of gasoline. Now, the advantage of nuclear power is that A, it's carbon neutral. Uh, it doesn't produce any greenhouse gases. But B, nuclear fission, which is the splitting of atoms to get energy out. Nuclear fission is a million times more energy dense than fossil fuels, which means, uh, let's, let's do the math here. If you had one ton of coal, you could get the same energy out of it as one gram of nuclear fuel. A thousand kilograms versus one gram. That is why nuclear power is so amazing. Uh, Affinity says, I got wood. Cool. Um, why nuclear fusion is even more uh, what we want and uh, e even more exciting is because nuclear fusion is a thousand times more energy dense than nuclear fission. Which means now we're talking about uh, a million kilograms of coal to equal one gram of nuclear fusion fuel. That's incredible, right? Bored and watching says, hey, Kyle, are you planning on going to MTG Vegas for the 30th this October? I'd love to meet you. Yes, I am. Give me a fist bump. I mean, I probably am. Speaking of uh, Wizards of the Coast, if you haven't checked out our fully sponsored video from Wizards of the Coast about Dungeons and Dragons that dropped this morning, go check it out after the stream. Anyway, so nuclear fusion is a mil uh, million times... Nuclear fission is a million times more energy dense than something like fossil fuels. Nuclear fusion is a billion times more energy dense. But here's where it gets complicated. We have figured out how to do nuclear fission pretty well. We do it in our nuclear reactors all around the world. Um, nuclear uh, fission is the splitting of larger atoms. As you can see up there, that fission line up there near, near uranium-238, it's a large nucleus. That means that it has a lot of parts to it. Protons, neutrons, electrons, it's a big nucle nucleus, relatively speaking. Now, we can split those atoms by flinging neutrons into them. And the cool thing is, radioactive elements fling neutrons out naturally. So if we put a lot of that material close together, enough neutrons fling out such that it separates these large nuclei, splits them, that releases more neutrons and it continues on in a chain reaction. If you put them in the correct orientation with the correct amount of material, you have a so-called critical mass. This critical mass generates heat with all the high energy particles flying out. We put that heat in water, heats to steam, spins turbines, fission nuclear energy. Easy! You can't do the same with nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is smashing atoms together or getting them so close together that they overcome their natural repulsion from each other 
like you have to do when you sit with that kid at lunch, overcome the natural repulsion to each other such that the nuclear force takes over and it slams them together. Now, the strong nuclear force, we're getting a little bit in the weeds here, but the strong nuclear force is one of the strongest forces in the universe. And if two things get close enough, it will take over. But what acts at a larger distance is electrical repulsion, like from electrons. So what we try to do with fusion is get past the electron resistance until the nuclear force takes over and bam! In both of these processes, when atoms come together or they split apart, some mass is lost. That mass turns into energy according to E equals mc squared, and you get a lot of it per gram, as we just pointed out. Okay? So for fusion... Like I said, we need to overcome electrical repulsion, so we don't want very many electrons at all. Uranium has hundreds of electrons. Helium has one. But we also want to increase the nuclear strong force. More nucleides, more, more parts of it, more force to pull stuff together, so we want the lowest number of electrons with the most number of neutrons. That gives us the power of the sun in the palm of your hand. That's what we call deuterium and tritium. You've heard of these things before, and that is what is in this little dot. Deuterium and tritium, so-called heavy hydrogen, hydrogen with extra neutrons. That is what we use in nuclear, fission, uh, nuclear fusion. Now you see up there in this graph, fusion only works up until a point where there's too much electrical repulsion and thing, and, and we can't overcome that and gain net energy. Similarly, on the fission side, we see that if you get too close to iron, you're not getting net energy from this process either. Okay? So that is a very basic explanation of why we choose the fuels that we do. Light, not very much repulsion, big nucleus, easy to split and continue on. That's why we use these two different fuels, okay? I think you're following along. Ryan Lange with the 10. Hey Kyle, former college dropout here. I just got an A plus in physics this summer. Huge credit to you and all other science communicators for teaching me that science is a human and achievable endeavor. Cheers, Ryan. That made my day. Ray, good luck with the Australian $20. They are from Australia, so you know what we gotta do. Morning songs, Kyle. How you going, buddy? Any idea when the next Chernobyl video will be? Shout out to my gorgeous, gorgeous girl, gorgeous girlfriend, and my younger brother who's dealing with COVID at the moment. Stay safe and stay smart, folks. Ray, appreciate it. I hope your brother uh, recovers swiftly and safely. Shout out to your gorgeous girlfriend. I look at her. D don't worry, chat. That's not... I'm, my accent is really good. Don't worry about it, okay? Yeah, Predator. I'm, I'm making Predator lose their mind right now. Look at that emoji. So, are we all on the same page? I like to do this, this kind of analysis, these kind of streams with you, because it really does feel like we're in a little classroom together, right? I like that. So, everyone kind of on the same page? So, fusion, this is the kind of fuel we need. We want to use it because it's a thousand times more energy dense than fission. Now, this deuterium and tritium, wow, that's actually not a bad accent, saying hello from West Australia. I know. Have you ever won a commander game? <laughs> yeah. Over about 250 games that I've recorded in the last two years or so, uh, my win rate is above 50%. So, yeah. Um, so this deuterium and this tritium is put in a little pellet like this. This little pellet, this tiny thing, that's my finger, by the way. I filmed in, in one of these locations, at the uh, uh, NI NIF. That's the size of my finger. So you can see how small this thing actually is. That little pellet, that's what three football fields worth of lasers is shooting at. Just that. Okay? 
that's that deuterium and tritium that we talked about. Now comes the complicated part, okay? So, there are two kinds of fusion technologies that we're pursuing. The first looks like this. The first looks like this, Chet. This is inside of the facility's own tokamak reactor. What tokamak reactors seek to do is confine plasma magnetically so tightly that it comes together with enough pressure and enough temperature that these nuclear fusion reactions happen. Remember what we said. Get these atoms close enough together with enough pressure and enough temperature, which is just movement of particles, you know that. Get them close enough together, they overcome the repulsion and snap together due to the nuclear strong force. Okay? How long is three football fields only proper units? Oh, that's why everyone was saying that. Yes, sorry. Three football fields is 300 meters. So we're talking about almost a kilometer, uh, sorry, not a kilometer. I was thinking three by three. So a uh, 300 meters, so a, a third of a kilometer. It's a long way, just for giant laser tubes, right? So, uh, this is magnetic confinement, MCF, magnetic confinement fusion. Have, you see all these, all of my, uh, electromagnets in here, keep plasma, this this wriggling hot gas keep it in check with magnetic fields and hyper complicated machines squeeze it squeeze it squeeze it until it overcomes electrical repulsion bam they snap together some mass is lost that is converted directly into energy according to einstein's equals mc squared this is not the breakthrough that we're talking about today what would be chat another way to get stuff close enough together turning on a fan close enough together that it could overcome these forces well spoiler alert laser beams so the fusion dance is better than the port of fusion in dragon ball got it thanks professor hill sure whatever you just said now the other type of fusion the one the breakthrough is uh about is called inertial confinement fusion, ICF. Now, you know inertia. Inertia is the tendency for, um, for an object to continue on in a straight line forever un uh, until it's acted on by an outside force. So what's happening in inertial confinement fusion is actually pretty cool. Step one. Because remember, we're trying to squish this fuel together and keep it together. Magnetism does it in this case, in that case, but in this case, inertial confinement fusion is so hot right now. Do you know if the NIF is putting more focus on power research instead of weapons research? I don't know. I can't talk about weapons research. So, inertial confinement, using mass that wants to continue on in some motion to confine fuel. Step one, you take deuterium and tritium fuel, you put it in a little thing like that. Outside of that fuel is something that you want to heat up. That is this gold hull-rom right here. It's called a hull-rom. Just call it a fusion tube. It's fine. That's a cross-section, by the way. You wouldn't see that, that little dot. It's a, it's a cylinder. Okay? This is the cylinder in that case. Fuel cylinder. Fuel cylinder. Fuel. Step two. You slam that cylinder with all the laser beams you can get. In this case, 300 meters worth of laser tubes, 192 laser beams going, going, going through that big metal ball that we saw, all impinging on a single point in a matter of nanoseconds. All this energy goes into absolutely destroying this fusion tube. Okay? This fusion tube, then, because it gets destroyed, the equal and opposite reaction of that is to press inwards. 
like a rocket engine. It explodes, which forces... Wait, so if it's exploding outwards, to explode outwards, it must be pressing inwards, right? <laughs> Equal and opposite reactions. So we annihilate this fusion tube, which forces all the tube's mass, or some of the tube's mass, down, down, down into step three. Step three has all of this, uh, not all of this, but a little bit of this mass super, super heated at a uh, hundred million atmospheres and a hundred million degrees Celsius. This has a lot of inertia. Like we said, this inertia squeezes the fuel down in step three, squeezes the fuel to a smaller space than it's ever been in in its little atomic life. And when this very complicated shape charge, exactly, extremely complicated shape charge. And once it's at a sufficient density, temperature, and pressure, step four, it overcomes the repulsion, snaps together, loses some energy, loses some mass, which gets converted into energy. Bam, we have a fusion reaction. <laughs> step four, profit. So is everyone following me so far? What is really important to understand, and I just uh, fully understood what's happening here today, is that the lasers themselves are not the inertia-having thing that compresses the fuel. Instead, we're exploding something around the fuel which compresses it. That's the inertia, the stuff around it, because it wants to keep going. So it compresses the thing, okay? Everyone get that? If that sounds familiar to some of you nuclear nerds, that's because the very first successful inertial confinement device was the hydrogen bomb. What a hydrogen bomb does, it's a fission bomb around a fusion bomb. The fission bomb goes off, slams all the material down into the thing to be fused, and then the fusion bomb goes off. The first successful device like this was a hydrogen bomb. A fusion bomb, a thermo, uh, thermobaric, no, what am I saying? Thermonuclear bomb. Okay? So, we're almost to the breakthrough. I think everyone understands why we want fusion, how we do different kinds of fusion, and what this kind of fusion is. Lasers blowing something up, that reaction compresses the fuel which reacts. Got it? We have Misty with the 20 says, hey show, love the science. The algorithm brought me to your channel from aquascaping video somehow, and I'm glad it did. Misty, I'm glad too. Crystal with the 10 says, so science is using math to house a sun within a box, then fire pew pews into that box to make it light up, and then push all that sun math out of the box into a tube. So math was blinded by the light? Yeah, I, I mean, you guess you want to do my job for me. Now, I think, class, we all understand what we're talking about, right? So where does the breakthrough come in? By the way, I know all of this because <laughs> I went to the National Ignition Facility a couple years ago in a full Fallout cosplay, and I went and explored all of this. Like I said, that is my finger. There. Volta <laughs> yeah, okay. So, what is the breakthrough, Kyle? Yeah, yeah, chat. I'm not going to I'm not going to sugarcoat it here. I'm not sugarcoating. It. We're going directly into the data. All right. Now the data that I want you to look at, what is important here is this line. Fusion yield, y total measured in megajoules. Yeah, chat. We we look, I'm the only streaming scientist on this website. This is what you can expect from us. Okay, I'm not, gonna sh I'm not just going to make an analogy here. This is the data. This is the, these are the papers. Okay, fusion yield, y total, megajoules. Now, as you go down the line, uh, it alternates data simulation, data simulation, data simulation, and going to the right, it's further in time. Okay. Now, this is what that, all you need to understand is this. Look at the first numbers. Point one. Point one. 
point one, point one, one point four. This is the breakthrough. The first breakthrough in a while for fusion technology is that the fusion yield in megajoules is now over one megajoules. Over there to the right, 1.37. This, everything that you're hearing about in the news is about this 1.37 megajoule shot. What is important is that because it is an order of magnitude more energy than they've ever gotten, right? Order of magnitude means 10, 10 times. So multiply 0.17 by 10, you get 1.7. That's in the same ballpark as 1.37. So in order of magnitude more energy from the fusion, this indicates to the scientists that they had a successful ignition event. They did not just get residual heat from the x-rays and all that stuff. Um, this represents that they compressed it in the right way that they got some energy out. Okay. Master of all with the Australian $5. Haven't been here in ages, Kyle, and have to go in a minute, but I'm glad to see you. Hope you're doing well. I am hope you're doing well, mate. Thanks. Hope you have a go and a good one um, at that. So, 1.37 megajoules, that is energy released during this reaction. It's 10 times more than we've ever done before. It indicates that a fusion reaction, a sun in the palm of my hand, actually happened. That's amazing. However, did, did we just make a real-life Doc Ock machine from Spider-Man 2? That's a vibe I'm getting, says Kyle Wright with the five. Now... This is the question I had, Chad. This is the question that I had. 1.3 megajoules, million joules, is all, hey, ooh, great. But did it get net energy out of it? Which is to say, did it take more laser energy to make this than it got out? Because if it takes more energy to make it, then you get out of it, that's not power generation, right? The benefit of something like fossil fuels is you can just set it on fire. That's not a lot of energy for a lot of energy out, right? The problem with nuclear energy is that it's very hard <laughs> to get these reactions to happen. We've done it with nuclear fission, but what we need to do for nuclear fusion is to craft reactors that use less energy than they give out. And here is the interesting thing, chat, that I don't see reported anywhere. Hydonymous Rex with a Canadian $100. The science man says this is bad. Jokes aside, hope you're having a good time, dude. I hope you're having a good time as well. Anybody who's a T-Rex with a top hat and a monocle must be having a good time. Now here's the interesting thing, chat. You look further down in the same table, and you see something interesting. Why is Brian Kibler doing science as Luis Junior Ramos? He wishes he was doing anything like we're doing here. Why does my lighting keep change? Anyway. Whoop. Whoop. Energy from fusion from the target equals total measured energy divided by the energy it took to run the laser. Now, if you divide the energy you get out from this fusion reaction that they made, if you divide that by the, to the energy it took to make it, if that's anything less than one, it takes more energy to make it and we do not have a sustainable thing yet. Look, follow my finger, and look to the far right. You can see that even though we have had an order of magnitude increase in the total energy we're getting out, it's still 0.72. Which means that according to the definition of a working fusion reaction, or something that could go into a reactor, we have not gotten net energy out yet. 
Not a success, but still quite good. Yes, no, it must be said. Look, I mean, we're being 10 times more efficient. And all these papers are talking about how they changed. Uh, like, <laughs> Chet, everything that we talked about is incredibly complicated. I mean, look at, look at this thing. Look at this thing. Look at the size of the people compared to this thing. Look at the facility that we're talking about. Frickin' J.J. Abrams cut out this plexiglass floor just to film Star Trek here because this thing looks so insane. And that's true. So 0.72 is 10 times better than we've ever done. That's amazing. That's great. We're getting close. But this breakthrough is not generating net energy that you could use to turn turbines like a normal nuclear, nuclear reactor. So... We're close, but we're not quite there yet. The benefit for you, Chad, I hope, is that you know, you now know exactly how nuclear fusion works and how close we are to the next generation of power. That generation. Can we get some L's in the chat for a net loss of energy, says just some guy. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the result is pretty cool, but it's definitely not poggers. Uh, Keck W ratio fell off. Christopher with the five says, I think a good way to compare fusion and fission power might to be might be to compare gas and diesel. Gas wants to burn, but diesel needs to be compressed, heated. No, Chris, Christopher, I think, uh, I mean, it depends on what you want to compare. If you're, if you're talking about how they're actually used, sure. But, um, the difference between nuclear fission and fusion that's really important for the discussion is the energy density to me that it's a thousand times more energy dense than the other one um which would i mean think of think of if you needed a thousand times less reactors effectively like none right and then you have limitless energy if you have more than one right so that's that's the real thing we're looking at here Carl Jackson with the five says an undergrad professor told me that even if Q is greater than one materials to house a fusion reactor are centuries off to handle the temperature. Is that the case? Centuries. I, I don't think, I don't think about that. I, that doesn't sound. I'll do respect to your professor. That doesn't sound right to me. Um, the, the walls. <laughs> no, we went through this. Um, I think there there's there's real barriers to making a worker working fission reactor because the walls of the fusion reactor which will become heated that heat is transferred to water etc etc the walls will deal with a tremendous amount of heat and radiation damage i think uh the we read this on office hours but like even one of the best fusion reactor designs its walls like, a single reactor, its walls would be more radioactive than Chernobyl and would have to be replaced every two years. Something like that. <laughs> so that is a massive issue. Like, we could still dispose of all that, but uh, not easily. So there's still there's a couple of kinks to work out, okay? Jordan Pinch. Oops. Sly Wolf with a 10 says, what do you think of Z-Pinch fusion stuff? I'm actually working, or I'm talking with a company that does that. And so maybe we'll make a video about it. Um, Jordan Pinch with a 5, can you please explain how light does not have mass? If you can move things with it, uh, it would mean that as light has mass. Jordan, the weird thing is that light doesn't have mass, but it has momentum. And to get any more complicated than that, I would have to talk about relativistic science that I do not fully understand. Well, not enough to speak about it a lot. We're doing all this live. I'm doing all this off the top of my head. I'm trying my best out here. But why light has momentum is a relativistic thing that I'm not, I don't feel comfortable fully explaining. It probably has something to do with relativistic mass increase kind of thing. Um that it that that it operates as though it has mass because it's moving at the speed of light but it doesn't have mass because it's the only thing that moves at the speed of light photons um but to answer your question quickly light has momentum and that's why you can push solar sails and stuff with it and that's why you can ab ablate atmospheres 
with solar wind. That's not quite true. There's more stuff in solar wind than... Shut up. Kristoff's again with the five. Are there forms of energy creation that don't require water to spin turbines, generate usable electricity, or is that still a terrestrial component? Um, uh, wind. Wind. Water. Um, solar. You can just gen- you can just spin stuff directly with that. Right? Just a, a wind turbine is already a turbine that's already spinning. Oh, I see you, Z. Ooh, I see you there. I see you there, Z. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this psychopath. Look. Look at this Giga Chad. Here, we'll get to you. Sean with the 10 says, Voyager 1 has been traveling at roughly 30,000 miles an hour for 43 years, and it's only 20 light hours away. How many years will it be when it gets to 24 light hours? Thank you for being awesome, Kyle. Sean, you can do that math, buddy. I can't do it off the top of my head. Um, so you're talking about four light hours, and it's been traveling 30, uh, 30 million miles an hour. So all you have to do is convert units there. If you want to go to Wolfram Alpha, you would divide four light hours by 30,000 miles per hour, and it will give you that time. You're welcome. Z with the five hundred dollar donation. What a what a what a what a oh man! I can't Z. Thank you again for your incredible patronage. We are honored to have you at the facility in the Discord. Thank you again. If you guys don't know Z, Z wakes up every day, puts on a leather jacket, a riding leather jacket with a with a carbon fiber spine built in the back for their motorcycle. They don't put on bottoms. They don't need bottoms. They get <laughs> they get on their motorcycle, screaming down their own private autobahn, taking wads of cash, throwing it at local flora and fauna. Yes, that kind of person. And sometimes I'm on the side of the road like, hey, and it, oh, get hit by hundreds of dollars in the face. Hey, Kyle, or Kai Kyle, I am Nangri. I have almost missed another stream again. Don't worry about it, Z, trust me. Also, I send you a message on Patreon with a question. If you can call it that, Z, I will get to it right after this. Thank you, Z. Marlon May, with the five, says, 0.76 in terms of energy production is closer than ever before. Will it require a breakthrough to achieve 1.00001, or can can iterative improvements do it, says Marlon May. Um, So the cool thing about these fusion papers is that it was all about, it wasn't, it wasn't like a technological breakthrough. It was more becoming more efficient, um, uh, physically placing things differently, aligning things differently, um, working with the fuel differently. It was making minor improvements that led to a large tenfold improvement. So Marlin, fingers crossed, it wouldn't take, it just takes more, as you say, iterative improvements on alignments and, and energies to get past that 100, not 100, but point, uh, 1.0 uh, ratio that we're looking for. So this wasn't like a, this was a breakthrough in the sense that this is more energy than ever before, but it's not a breakthrough in that we're doing something totally different. Jasper Jedi with a five. Are you aware if this advancement could either directly or indirectly be applied to tokamaks? As I understand it, tokamaks are more prevalent. Yeah, there's, there's more tokamak fusion reactors, but as we, if you want to rewind a little bit, as we were discussing, um, tokamaks operate in a completely different way. So, uh, given that so much has to do with how you're aligning this tiny little fuel pellet and how the lasers are meeting it and, and the shape, the shape of that little thing that you, you obliterate around it is absolutely critical, like down to the nanometer, micrometer kind of stuff. So that doesn't really apply to tokamaks in the way that they're designed. Zaelson! Zalcyon with the five says, so why aren't there thermoelectric substances used to augment energy production? I've been talking a lot. Speaking of talking a lot, if you want to see us here at the facility continue on the sci-fi masterpiece that is Portal, we'll be playing through Portal on the Kyle Hill Gaming Channel in just about 45 minutes. I hope to see you all there. The second I end this stream, you will all be redirected if you want to. Come watch us science a murderous AI. Lots of plants have waste heat 
Even if small, watts are watts. Why aren't thermoelectric substances used to augment electricity generation? Zelson, I you'd have to be more specific. It depends on exactly what you're talking about in terms of recovering waste heat, etc., etc. I think for fusion, it's less about recovering small amounts of waste heat than it is to just get the energy production itself over the line. We're, uh, fusion experiments today aren't gathering heat. They're not gathering heat to heat up water yet. They're not producing electricity. They're just trying to get more energy measured in joules out of the fusion reaction than it took for the lasers to inertially confine the thing. That's it. I'm off to take care of some mental health stuff, but wanted to say thanks for helping me understand fusion better. Also, Z is awesome. This is Liquid Flames. Liquid, have a good rest of your day. I agree. Z is pretty cool. Light has energy, and energy acts as mass, uh, according to Einstein. E equals mc squared, or m equals e divided by c squared. That's an easy way to think about massless light, in my opinion, says J Val with the 90. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I said. Chat, peer review, as I want to do on every episode of Office Hours, I like to I like to go back to the latest episode of the facility, take my favorite comment, and expand upon it for your benefit. Your benefit? Ooh, that's an New Zealand accent. I've been watching Wellington Paranormal on HBO Max. I've been watching Wellington Paranormal on HBO Max, and uh, it's made by the same guys who do what we do in the shadows, it's actually in the same universe. So if you like that show, you're gonna love Wellington Paranormal. It's about a bumbling police squad in New Zealand that is investigating paranormal phenomena and uh, some of that accent has been washing over me like a, like a calm New Zealand hob, whatever. Anyway. Anyway. Um, the latest episode of the facility is Whoop! How to play Dungeons and Dragons in space? We did a whoop. We did a fully customized video with Wizards of the Coast in honor of the new Spelljammer campaigns coming out today. If you want to check out that video, if you want to check out Spelljammer, do. It sounds a lot of fun. It's basically all your favorite adventures, but in space. And I give you a little some. Uh, some sciencey rules to augment your adventures if you want. And we actually sent a D20 to space in this episode. Go watch it. Anyway. I already know. So I, I'm not going to waste your time, Chad. I already know what I want to say here. And it's from Gabriel Strong. Gabriel, on my episode about D&D &D in space E. You could also work out the changes to fall damage on different planets. Depending on the gravity and the atmosphere thickness, the terminal velocity will change. That will change the maximum fall damage, but also the fall distance that happens at. Okay. I don't know how to say it, Gabriel, but you're 100% correct. David Dew says, have you played Star Citizen? No, but I was watching Dr. Lupo play it, and it made me want to play it, so I might play it. Gabriel Strong, you're absolutely right. And you're more right than you know. And I even replied, what did I say? I said, great idea. I actually have an equation for that, actually. <laughs> Bam! This is the equation for terminal velocity. How you get it is very simple. Terminal velocity is the velocity at which your weight is canceled out by drag. So you fall to the earth because you have a weight. Have you beaten Post Malone yet in Magic? Yes. Multiple times. You fall to your Earth according to the gravitational acceleration due to Earth's gravity field. But that will be eventually equaled out by how the wind is pushing back on you. How the air is pushing back on you as you fall through it. Set those two equations equal to each other. Solve for VT. You get this relatively simple equation. Now, Gabriel Strong says, change fall damage on different planets depending on the gravity and the atmosphere thickness. Gravity? G. Atmosphere thickness, rho, which is that P-looking thing right there. So Gabriel Strong is exactly right. Watch what happens to VT. If we increase G in the numerator, what happens? 
velocity has to go up. So your terminal velocity on a planet or a neutron star or something like that can get like close to the speed of light because the gravity is insane. But if you're on a planet like Jupiter, which does have very high gravity, but has extremely thick atmosphere, maybe your terminal velocity, if the denominator gets a lot larger, your terminal velocity goes down. So falling through something very thick, like a thick atmosphere on some spell jamming ship planet, it could be, it could be just a, it could be casual, baby. That's why small rodents can't die from fall damage. That's why bugs will never die from a fall. It's because their terminal velocity is so low. And if you wanted to do that, Gabriel, in your, comp- in your campaigns, you find a planet where you can jump off your spell jamming ship and land, ooh, kind of, Pretty casually on the surface. I mean, it's going to have a really, really low surface gravity, and you're going to be breathing in what is effectively like soup. But you could do that, and you could, uh, as uh, Dun Dunrick Ironhammer, Lord of the North and Victor of the South, says, and you can change jump distances. Yes, the less surface gravity on a planet, the easier it is for you to do. You can do the same amount of work with your legs, but go higher. So Gabriel. Strong, you're absolutely correct. Not only can you do that, but you can do that accurately, which is most important. So Gabriel, for nailing that equation and the variables therein, you are now an honorary member of the facility. <laughs> I don't know why I moved you back. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, Kevin's going to get you a plaque. Yes. Oh, oh. Pog in the chat. Pog in the chat. Kevin's got your... That's... Kevin, that's not a plaque. That is a number of swiping pads that I got in Chernobyl to wipe down radioactive surfaces? (laughs) You think I'm going to give them that? (laughs) Uh, I meant to go to a break. No breaks. All gas. All gas. Uh, I see Liz in the chat. Liz, losing my touch late again. Don't worry about it, Liz. My tiny human Alex's question of the week. Hey, I saw I saw that Alex was wearing his facility lab coat and that he has an amazing head of hair. You tell him both those things. How do waffle makers work to make it hot enough to cook waffles? <laughs> and I like syrup. I had to add that squirrels don't take fall damage. See Mark Rober. There's no backwards hats today. So I can't be Mark Rope. But um, waffle makers make waffle makers hot enough to make her waffles, Alex, just through electricity. So, you know, when you plug something into the wall, electricity will move through that thing, right? Well, if that thing that the electricity is moving through resists that a lot, it doesn't want the electricity moving through it, that creates heat, right? So you imagine you trying to run through a, a, a big obstacle course and you're, in a, you're, to, you're, you're smashing through these, the, these poles that are upright and you're, uh, 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 and you're getting hot and it's hard and there's a lot of commotion. That's the same thing that happens in what we call heating elements. We put electricity through it The heating elements don't really like it, so they heat up a lot. And we use that heat to make your little cooking surface hot. And that's it. That's it. I probably made some false analogies there. That's fine. Alex, put on your lab coat. No one's going to... Who's going to question you if you're wearing a lab coat? Hi, Donimus Rex again with the Canadian 20. T-Rex in a top hat. Dot com. One thing I like to say while I have your ear, I love your Half-Life histories. They are so good. Don't worry. I'm starting, I'm writing my next Half-Life history script this week. Oh, and thanks for helping me come up with my next D&D character, a ranger, artificer, scholar. Cheers, dude. Ooh, sounds interesting. Jay Justin with the five dollars. Just want to say your Asperger's video changed my life. I now understand myself so much better. Thank you, Kyle. Jay, it's obviously the best praise I can get. I simply wanted to understand my life 
and my interactions with life better. So if, if me sharing my experience can in any way, can in any way um, help you on your journey, I'm honored and humbled, Jay. Plus, it looks like you're a samurai stormtrooper, so <laughs> you're fine. How often would a samurai stormtrooper miss with a sword, you think? Seems harder to miss with a sword. If you're, like, right up next to somebody. Yeah. Nate King says, uh, May I ask you if you dye your hair, Kyle? It looks too good to be true. <laughs> so the first thing you want to... Random shout out to my wife, who I'm now making watch this with me, LOL, says Brandon Wirtz. Brandon, look, if she doesn't want to watch it, it's fine. But also, what up, Mrs. Wirtz? <laughs> I don't know why I said, I don't know. And it's not, okay, fine. I'm sorry for doing that. But also. <laughs> I don't want to cause any trouble. Oh, she loves me too. Hmm. Okay. Okay. <sighs> Chat, as I was saying, uh, about 30 minutes from now, you will be automatic. Well, once I close the stream down, you'll be automatically directed on the same YouTube page if you want to. But about 30 minutes from now, I think we will be playing through the second half of Portal, one of the best games ever made, a game that is. Nick, shut up. One of the... <laughs> a game that is centered around science. It takes place in a science lab. It's all about science. Last time we streamed it, we talked about everything from wormholes to lasers to energy balls to all these kinds of things. And I think as we close out Portal and finish it, uh, I have no doubt in my mind that we will also have a lot of science to offer as we do that. Um, so if you want to see me do that, that's in the next 30 minutes... That's 4.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I hope to see you there. You can also go to the facility and hang out in the Discord, and you'll see everything that we do. Um, would you ever do a video about the Nuclear Boy Scout? I've heard of it, but I don't know exactly what you're talking about. I will say that, don't worry, I have a lot of uh, Half-Life history ideas in, in, sorry, in, uh, in my back pocket. Um, right now, what I'm gravitating towards since I've done kind of like the big three of nuclear disasters, which is Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island. Um, and we have more Chernobyl videos coming out. Uh, and well, I, I don't want to speak too, too much, but I'm, I'm in contact with, uh, some of the people at Chernobyl who were there when it was occupied. And I, I, I might be able to interview some of them, um, but we'll see. But I still have multiple Chernobyl videos coming out. We'll finish out a little series about the tour of the plant. Uh, I went inside the dome where the sarcophagus is. I don't think any civilian gets to do that. I got to do that. It was incredible. But we also have videos coming out about the dogs of Chernobyl. The wild dogs of Chernobyl and what we're doing to save them. About how social media kind of ruined Pripyat. Lots of cool stuff. Uh, I, I talked with the guy who touched the elephant's foot. So all that's coming. But um, now, I was getting off track. Now, since I've done the, some of the bigger nuclear disaster stuff, I'm focusing on some of the smaller things that most people have never heard of before that are still have an amazing story to be told. Like our last video that gave us some views. Oh, uh, About the time we nuked five men to prove a point. So I want to find... Stories like that that you may not have heard of before. And that's what I'm doing. Liz, I had to pull... I had to send it in the chat, but you are correct that wearing a lab coat does make one seem as an authority figure. And you're more or less believed. Hey, my master's in psychology is finally useful. Whew. Put on a lab coat. No one's going to say nothing. Uh, wind scale? Yes. Irradiated dogs? Yes. All of this... All of this is on... Um... All of this is, is, is on the docket. It's coming down the pike or pipe. I don't know what it is. 
Um, but uh, for the dog specifically, because I know it's gonna, everyone's gonna want to see this. But um, there's a population of wild dogs in Chernobyl and puppies. I saw them um, that have lived there since pets were abandoned during the disaster. And 35 years on, 36 years on, um, there's still a population of wild dogs there. I'm working with a uh, charity that goes out, monitors them, vaccinates them, all that good stuff. And I hope that we will be able to release that video as a fundraiser. And so you will be able to directly help the little uh, dogs of Chernobyl. Um, or as I call them, puppyettes. <laughs> you can even... I'm not saying you should do this. And I don't know what the situation is now with the war in Ukraine. So you probably can't do this right now. But you can adopt a Chernobyl dog. Are they radioactive? Slightly. <laughs> but not enough to do anything to you. Sarbamba, that's on the list. Puppyets. Puppyet. That's what I called all of them. Puppyet. Anyway. Chat, what did we talk about today? We talked about nuclear fusion. Just to recap, I think we went... Oh, uh, radioactive but super cute pupper, says H. Templar. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say, how do you know about that? Uh, they know about that. Um, you won't believe... Like, once you see... Uh, Lawton, what about the cats? So there are cats in, there are a lot of cats in the town where all the workers live in Slavutich. There's whole sections of the town where just wild cats are everywhere. Um, but in the zone, um, since it's kind of a jungle out there and there's wild dogs and stuff and wild boars, um, there's not really cats in the zone as far as I understand it. Um, they were kind of wiped out. But... Still a population of wild dogs, and they are some of the most beautiful-looking dogs I've ever seen. Because all of the abandoned pets, you know, interbred, and they were all, you know, pet-worthy dogs, right? And so they all, all the all the puppyettes now look like a new breed that is Chernobyl-specific, and they're 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 gorgeous animals. Anyway. Chat, we talked about what fusion is, what nuclear fusion is, what the breakthrough as of, uh, the papers came out last year, but as of publication a couple weeks ago, I think you now know enough to explain nuclear fusion at least to yourself and what the new breakthrough is. We're now achieving energies 10 times what we were able to before, but we're not yet clearing net energy production. That's where we want to go next, but we're getting closer. Chat, if you want to continue on this conversation, the best place to do so, by far, is to join the facility. To go to patreon.com slash kylehill, you get videos early, like you did yesterday, you get behind the scenes photos and videos, you get to vote on titles and thumbnails for every video, you get a private members only state the facility monthly live stream, and what most people tell me is their favorite part, you get access to one of the nicest, nerdiest discords on the internet. I hope to see you there. And I hope to see you in the next 30 minutes, where in 30 minutes we'll continue on from the command center, the gaming command center, our journey into Portal, one of the best games ever made, incredibly sciencey. We're going to science the crap out of it and hopefully finish it today. I want to see you there. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, night, evening, morn, dusk, period, Wherever it is where you are, I want you to have a great rest of it while you're conscious. That sounded uh, kind of... Um, and until next time, of course. Wherever it is that I see you, whether it's live, whether it's a VOD, it doesn't matter to me. I hope you have an inclination to be nice to each other. <laughs> I didn't want to repeat myself. Because remember, this is all we got. See you in a bit.